Welcome to another edition of Green is Good. This is the Web Tech edition of Green is Good, and I've got as my co-host today, I'm honored to have, I should say, as my co-host today, John Freeman. He's the VP of Global Partnerships and Government Affairs of GE's Water Business, and we're so excited to have as our guest, Ken Kaposis. He's the Deputy Assistant Administrator for the Environmental Protection Agency. Welcome to Green is Good. Well, thank you very much. It's really good to be here. Well, we're, th we're thankful for you being here, and of course, you can find uh, Ken and his colleagues at www.epa.gov. We're gonna be talking about green is the new gray and of course, uh, water issues today, Ken. But before we do that, talk a little bit about your background leading up to the important position you have today at the US EPA and how you even got there. Well, it's, it's, uh, I, I got there uh, having had the pleasure of being asked by uh, the Obama administration would I come and, and fill in in the Office of Water. Uh, I have a long background in the Office of Water, uh, or in the, in the field of water, I should say, uh, having begun uh, up on Capitol Hill in the mid-1980s, uh, working for uh, the, what was then the House Public Works and Transportation Committee. Um, that's the uh, committee where it uh, has jurisdiction over uh, the clean water programs, um, and then also our water resources programs, how we develop water. So, um, so we have a, we had a, a variety of things that were within our interest, and so I, I then spent uh, the next uh, about 27 years, mostly on the House side, but also had a stint on the Senate side, uh, working water issues as well. So that has given me a real appreciation for how significant water is, and as you said in your introductory remarks, how important it is really that we try to work to make sure that the place that we inherit is a little bit better when we pass it on to our children. Well, that's great. And uh, well, this is your show today and you're, you and John are two of the uh, experts on water in the whole entire world. I couldn't ask for better guests and better co-hosts than John Friedman. Um, you know, where do we start? Where would you like to start? Where, you know, in terms of, we hear every day in the newspaper that there's droughts in California, there's droughts around the world, and we're running out of water to drink, water to use, water to sustain this great planet that we've all enjoyed while we've been alive. You know, talk a little bit about where you think we are right now here in the United States and what you're working on specifically at the US EPA. Well, there's no doubt that we face some serious, serious water issues here in this country today and around the globe. Mm. And they're brought on by a variety of reasons. You know, the, uh, the general amount of water globally, of course, is the same today as it was millions of years ago. Mm. But what we have is a different balance. We have people in different places. When people first settled in this country, they settled in the areas that were wetter, along the northeast and in the southeast. It wasn't really until uh, much, much later when they found gold in California and they invented air conditioning that brought people to the southwest uh, that we started to get this imbalance of, of people being where there were scarce water resources. In recent years, it's become even more important because we have seen changes in weather patterns. We think that it is a reflection of climate change. There is no doubt that all of the models that have been run indicate that a warming climate will affect the patterns of precipitation. And so what you see is you're going to see more severe storms in some areas. You're going to see much drier patterns in other areas. And in, for states like California, for example, it's particularly troublesome because not only is California suffering through a drought, California's largest source of water is that snow that falls every winter on the Sierra Nevadas. And since they've now gone through four straight years with way, way below averages for snow. In fact, this last one was the lowest amount of snowfall that they've been able to measure in 500 years. So what you're seeing is a situation where, where climate changes have affected how water is available to people, and it's also, of course, how, how we uh, use and, and manage water. So one of the things that we're giving a lot of priority to at EPA is not only protecting water quality in streams, lakes, rivers, and, and shorelines, but also in making sure that that water is available and fresh and clean for you at your tap as, as well. And what are the ways that we can, we can har harvest water and use it in a way that makes more sense than the ways that we've used it in the past? Gotcha. You know, Ken, so uh, EPA has the Safe Drinking Water Act to ensure that drinking water is safe, and it has the Clean Water Act to ensure that we protect our nation's waterways through wastewater discharges. Um, how, do you, how does EPA engage on the uh, concept of water reuse? Well, water reuse has become a much more popular topic 
uh, everywhere. Uh, and, it's, and it's one that's really critical. As I said earlier, the, the water that we have today is the water that's been around all along. So, so, uh, so we reuse water all the time, but we don't make that connection that we, in fact, are taking water, using it at the tap, and it goes out of our homes or out of our businesses, and we expect that it just disappears someplace, and we don't focus on how it is that we can, we can harvest that and create a water resource for all of us to use. I actually, uh, I, I often cite, I, I, I'm a living example of water reuse. Uh, where I live in the Northern Virginia area, where the water that leaves my house goes to the wastewater treatment plant, they treat it at the wastewater treatment plant, but it does not go to the Potomac River. Most of the times it is then pumped uphill to the reservoir that supplies me with my drinking water. Wow. Now it's, it's augmented by natural flows into that reservoir, but I live water reuse every single day. Most people don't know that. But it is something that we practice in our area on a very micro scale. But we practice it on a macro scale as well. You know, water that's, that's discharged in upstream rivers is used by downstream consumers. And what we're looking at now is how is it that we can use evolving technologies to better make use of water in the location itself. We've seen instances of that uh, in Texas in response to drought, where we're talking about direct potable reuse. The water goes from the waste treatment plant to the drinking water treatment plant and right back to the homes in a closed loop system. And technologies are what have made those kinds of advances available. But from a, from a regulatory uh, standpoint, Ken, is there something that EPA can do to, to create uh, regulations around this, to give people comfort that the level of treatment is appropriate for the type of use or, or to create guidelines or you know, what, what can EPA do? Well, we've been out there encouraging people. People do need to understand that there's not a regulatory prohibition on doing that. Um, our standards under the Clean Water Act require that water be treated to a certain level before it leaves the plant. That's where the Clean Water Act kicks in. The Safe Drinking Water Act requires that water be of a certain quality and value when it's available at the tap. So those two things uh, can work very much in tandem. In all candor, um, the, the, the direct reuse of wastewater uh, suffers from what we call the yuck factor. Um, but of course, when you don't have any water, you can get over the yuck factor pretty quickly. Um, but, the, uh, but there's also issues that we've identified that we have to work with, often with state health departments, for example, who are not, their, their programs aren't set up for this. And it's not that they're working to say that they're opposed to it. It's just that many of the laws and regulations that are in place place today were put in place at a time when people weren't thinking about this. Mm. So we've been out there trying to communicate that this is a real world option that people have to consider as they look at how to best manage their water resources. So you're saying beyond the, the, the yuck factor at, with the public at large, in some areas there's even political resistance due to the infrastructure that exists today and overcoming that is also one of the hurdles that leaders like you at the US EPA need to continue to do to drive the future of appropriate water reuse in the United States. That's absolutely the case. I mean, we at EPA, you know, we have a bit of a bully pulpit. pulpit. Mm -hmm. We can get out there and we can talk about things. We're happy to use it. Uh, our folks in our, our research offices, in our science and technology offices, in our drinking water offices are all very supportive of the idea of exploring how to get these options out there. And we think that there are tools available, but it does take a while to build it into the system. Um, and, it, and of course, it's also a reflection that a lot of the technologies that people will rely on to make direct reuse of this water, they didn't exist 30 or 40 years ago. Or if they existed, they were extremely expensive to operate from an energy standpoint. All of these are factors that we think we can bring to bear in a way to, to better manage these water resources going forward. So, so I wrote down bully pulpit. Uh, you can refer to my notes anytime you'd like. So I do think EPA goes, can go well beyond its uh, you know, defined public mission and use its platform to, to encourage people to do uh, very positive things. I'm wondering about the economics of treating wastewater for reuse. Um, do you think it's economically viable? Are you, are you seeing communities across the country uh, treat water, wastewater for reuse? We have been seeing it. Uh, primarily, we've been seeing it for two reasons. We've seen it in the, in the wastewater world where um, there was a desire to go ahead and use that water rather than, as gray water, if you will, uh, rather than using uh, fresh drinking water. 
um, and that has a, that has been in place in some communities around the country for a little while. But of course, there you have to have the infrastructure to deliver that water because you don't want it mixing with your potable with your drinking water. Right. But we've also seen a real uptick in an interest in using uh, wastewater as a drinking water resource um, in recent times, in large part based on drought situations. Uh, you talk about the cost, yes, it is more expensive than having a, a clean, fresh source of water that you can simply tap into a lake, a river, or, or even groundwater. Um, however, when you don't have those resources available, the value of that water shoots up dramatically. And even though it may be considerably more expensive to treat and provide, if the option is no water, uh, then the value of water, uh, you find it very quickly when it's not available. In about three days, yes. you drink just about anything. <laughs> right. um, and, and, but, you know, what about uh, technology development, um, Ken? What, what kind of role can EPA play in, in encouraging the development of new cutting edge technologies that'll bring down the cost of treating wastewater for use? Well, I think one of the things that's available to us is, is to work on spreading the message and making sure that people understand the public acceptability and, and, as you asked earlier, the regulatory acceptability. One of the things that we've spent a considerable amount of time on is answering that very question. When people say, oh, but I understand the rules don't allow me. And I, I personally have answered that question multiple times, the agency has answered it multiple times, and the answer is always, we do not, we at the federal level do not have any prohibitions on this. You're, if there are prohibitions, you're going to find them someplace else. And we are happy to work with people to get the word out that we think that this is a very viable option. We, would, we for the most part, would prefer to keep water in the stream, in the lake, where it is, rather than have people constantly pulling water out of, out of the system. When you pull large amounts of water out of the system, you affect the aquatic integrity of the ecosystem. So what we want to do is we want to keep it in the system where it is, and we want to figure out ways for people to make wise use of their water. We also, of course, are looking at technologies available uh, to make sure that when we do treat water and it goes out into the distribution system, that 20, 30 percent of it doesn't go out through leaks. If you're going to treat water, let's make sure it's used. Um, it, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a huge expenditure of the resource. It's a huge expenditure on energy to treat and move water. Uh, how do we eliminate that? So again, uh, one of the things that I've been doing uh, here today is walking around and looking at, at various exhibitors who are talking about how it is that we can, we can use technologies to make sure that we get the maximum return on our investment. You know, who better than you as a, as a great evangelist and ambassador, not only because of, as you say, the bully pulpit that you have as the deputy assistant administrator at the U.S. EPA, but more importantly, the story you shared with the fact that you live in northern Virginia and you're drinking the water in, that's in that closed loop system. Are other communities now, do you feel the velocity of other communities looking at systems like the one that exists where you live? Is that picking up and is your work, you know, of encouraging those communities to adopt these paradigms and get over them their, their, their own yuck factor or their own regulatory factors, is that becoming more the norm uh, that you've seen in recent months and, and in the last year or so? Yes, I, I definitely would say that over the last uh, months and, and last few years, you're seeing a real, a real heightened interest in looking at this as, as an option. Again, as, you, as we've seen, not only we've seen populations grow in areas that are naturally dry, and it's been exacerbated by the fact that those areas now receive even less rainfall than they did when they were classified as dry in the first instance. So you're taking an arid area and making it even more arid and, the, arid, and then you're adding more people to it. And those combination of factors are forcing people to really be looking at what are the opportunities. And the opportunities are going to be answered by two things. It's really going to be, are there technologies that are affordable and available for us to use? And then is there the political will to go ahead and use them? As I said earlier, I think that one of the things that's uh, really been happening is the availability of more technologies at lower cost. Um, and uh, and uh, that has been a key component. And then secondly, when you look at water scarcity, when you're a community, when you look out in your water reservoir, you can see the bottom throughout the entire reservoir, and you're told we have a few days' supply of water. Nothing focuses your attention quite like that sense of urgency. Yeah. You know, Ken, it's interesting because I think most people have no idea that EPA can help also help bring financial resources 
uh, to communities across the country to help implement these technologies. And maybe you can just say a word about how EPA does that. Well, we have a couple of different programs that we use to help communities, uh, the largest of which is our, our Safe Drinking Water Act Revolving Loan Fund Program, where we give approximately a billion dollars or so a year to the states. Uh, it varies a little bit from year to year based on uh, congressional appropriations. But we, we give that money to the states and, and they are using it to provide the uh, drinking water treatment and the drinking water facilities that are necessary uh, to provide this in incredibly important service to, this, to their citizens. We've also just recently launched a, a, uh, a new effort, our Water uh, Efficiency and Resiliency Finance Center, uh, which we launched as part of the administration's broader Build America initiative. The administration has been very committed to investing in infrastructure. And uh, while it's not always been easy to find more dollars to do it, we do think that there is a role for us to play to provide more information and more creativity in how we do it. How do, how do we work with communities? What are the options that are available? Our agency isn't the only one that provides money in this area. There's also money available through, the, through uh, HUD, the Housing Urban Development uh, Department, also through the Department of Agriculture, through its Rural Utility Service. So these are, these are monies that are available, but communities may not know how to package them together. Uh, we're also looking to explore ways that we can get communities to work in tandem with other communities. Uh, often when people talk about P3 partnerships, they talk about public-private partnerships. Yeah. And we think that there are areas there for private sector investment in the drinking water and the wastewater arena. But we also think that there are real opportunities for public-public mm -hmm. partnerships where communities band together to address a common need particularly when smaller and medium-sized communities, they may have real issues with being able to afford the kinds of investments that would be necessary to provide the services that their citizens expect. But when two or three communities join together, suddenly it may become much more affordable to use these new and advancing and, and, uh, and welcoming technologies. I, I, first of all, I had never heard of that before, but I think yeah. it's a great idea. <laughs> yeah. And I'm glad to hear that you guys are or uh, looking into that. The, the other thing, Ken, I was wondering about is um, when, when communities, uh, there, there are a bunch of different types of communities out there. Some are very affluent and some don't have enough money. Mm -hmm. For the communities that don't have mm -hmm. enough money beyond the state revolving loan funds, what are, what are their options? What do they do? Well, uh, that is one of the difficulties that we have. Um, as I said, some of the other agencies, uh, uh, both HUD and USDA, have an ability to provide money on a grant basis because we, we recognize there are some communities out there that even if we gave them zero interest loans, they still couldn't service the debt. Mm -hmm. And we really think that it's appalling that at this point in time in the United States of America, you have communities who cannot rely on a safe and secure source of water. And the, and the reason is because of uh, economics. And so we feel a very strong commitment. That's one of the reasons this the finance center that I mentioned, we do have both HUD and USDA as partners in working with us. We want to tap into that. Um, we, want to, uh, we want to make sure that, again, we use our ability to spread the word, to talk about these communities. We think that we also have opportunities to work with states. This is not solely a federal responsibility. I mean, our financial contribution is, 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 uh, is not the largest source of funding in this area, but we would like to work with states to see if there are options for us to explore how, how states can do it as well. We don't see a single answer here. We see a variety of answers. And if we in our programs can provide some money and we can bring some other federal dollars to the table, we can bring some state dollars, are there opportunities to bring other community dollars? Are there opportunities to bring other private sector dollars? How can all of these things be packaged? Because at the end of the day, if I need a dollar, it doesn't matter how many different people give me a dime. All I know is I need 10 dimes to get to a dollar, right? right. So I'll take 10, or I'll take 10 from 10 people, or I'll take five from five people. It doesn't really matter. So that's really what, what we see as, as an opportunity for us to get out there and be more creative on how we help these communities. You know, we're down to the last couple minutes or so, Ken. Can you share your vision on the future a little bit? You know, given where you sit, you have a lot of um, 
history behind you and you know a lot of what's gone on in, in previous years, but you also have a lot of visibility on the future. What's your thoughts on where we are today and the future of appropriately managing our water resources in the United States in the years to come? Well, we, there's no doubt about it. We have made great strides since the, since the days in the 1950s and 60s that led to all of our environmental statutes really were enacted in the late 1960s into the early 1970s. Uh, the, the waters are much cleaner than they were. Um, the, when the Clean Water Act was enacted in 1972, only one out of three water bodies met their water quality standards. Today, two out of three do. So we've doubled the number of waters, but we've still only made half our goals. So we don't have problems with the Cuyahoga River catching fire anymore, but we do have issues with huge algal blooms in Lake Erie that caused the city of Toledo to have to turn off their taps for three days a year ago in August. So that remains a problem. We have new and emerging uh, issues that we have to address, not the least of which is the nutrients that contributed to the algal blooms. So that's a, that's a, that's a real challenge. But as I say, the water is much safer. On the drinking water side, again, there's no doubt that we have made huge strides. I have had the pleasure over my career to travel to 28, in 28 different countries around the world. North America, South America, Central America, Europe, and Asia. In only two of those countries have I ever traveled and not been given some warning about the drinking water quality. And those two are the United States of America and Canada. Everywhere else, and these are not third world countries I've been traveling in, and yet, you know, and those warnings are everywhere from, you know, don't use it to drink, to don't eat fresh vegetables, to make sure when you take a shower, don't open your mouth, right. which is probably about the most severe. So, um, so we in this country are really blessed with the idea that I can go anywhere in the United States and turn on the tap and expect that water to be safe for me to drink. And that's a, that is a real luxury. But what I see is a, is a whole series of new things that we, we can't get complacent on. Um, I mentioned the uh, Cuyahoga River catching fire. It doesn't do that anymore, but yet we have a new problem. And so we have to continue to address those problems. We have to continue to look at what are ways to treat things that nobody ever thought we were going to have to treat for. Um, uh, the presence of microplastics in our drinking water and our wastewater is something that was not something that we thought about. The presence of very, very low levels of pharmaceuticals in our drinking water is another thing that people never really had to think about. I see us looking at, along those lines, needing to look at, you know, when drugs come on the market, FDA tests them for the recommended dosage to see what the effects are on people. But they don't really test for, okay, so if, the, if, if there's trace amounts in your drinking water for 70 years, what's the health effect of that? Um, so we have, we have challenges. We have a lot of successes. Um, I see us as, as needing to stay committed. I do think that climate is going to have a big impact on how we view water resources going forward because water is where we feel climate change first, whether it's drier areas, more severe storms, rising sea levels. All of those things are a direct result of changes in climate. And those are the things that we're going to feel right away in the water world. So it's a combination of the physical characteristics of water, but then also the chemical and quality aspects of water. Any final thoughts, John? I'm just really, John, I'm truly, I'm just happy for, for my family, Ken, that we have <laughs> committed right. public officials like you looking after really uh, this important public mission. Thank you. I'm also going to keep my mouth shut when I shower overseas. Um, I, I'll, tell you, I'll, I'll tell you later what country that was. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> really, thank you. And thanks for taking a broad perspective uh, to yeah. your role. Yeah. Well, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you so good. much. And for our listeners and viewers out there to find Ken and his great colleagues at the US EPA, please go to www.epa.gov. For John Freeman, I'm John Shigarian. Ken, thank you. As, as John just said, thank you for all the great work you do. Thank you for making the world a better place. You are truly living proof that green is good. Thanks so much. Thank you.